My name is John Graby, and I am the director of the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to UNH Law today for our panel discussion about fixing Washington through bipartisan leadership. It is difficult to imagine a timelier topic or one that would have been closer to Senator Warren Rudman's heart. Today's event has been organized by the Concord Coalition, with which the Rudman Center is proud to regularly partner. The Concord Coalition is a nonpartisan organization that seeks to inform the public about the risks and consequences of a growing federal debt. Fiscal responsibility was yet another topic that was uh, dear to Senator Rudman's heart. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. David Jolly was a Republican congressman from Florida from 2014 to 2017. He is a strong campaign finance reform advocate who introduced legislation to prohibit any member of Congress from soliciting a campaign donation. In Congress, uh, Congressman Jolly also promoted balanced budgets and tax reform, always looking to build consensus with colleagues across the aisle. Congressman Patrick Murphy was a Democratic congressman from Florida, in, for Florida from 2013 to 2017. He introduced legislation to eliminate billions in wasteful government spending and pushed for reforms in the national flood insurance market. He also formed the bipartisan United Solutions Caucus to bring members of both parties together to explore ways to get the nation's financial house in order. Congressman Jolly and Murphy are on a national speaking tour called Let's Fix Washington. Many of you may have had the opportunity to hear them this morning on Nash uh, New Hampshire Public Radio's The Exchange. It was an excellent show. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Bob Bixby, who will be moderating our discussion today. Bob is, of course, the executive director of the Concord Coalition. Bob. Thank you. I, I, these Seems like we'd be like a trio. We should start <laughs> on this. Well, thank you very much, John. This is uh, great. And thank you once again to the Rudman Center for uh, this program and again partnering with the Concord Coalition. Um, we, uh, I, I worked with both uh, Congressman Murphy and Congressman Jolly, or the Concord Coalition did when, um, when they were in office. And it's a diminishing breed, I'm sorry to say, of uh, members uh, of both parties that wish to reach across the aisle. And it makes it very difficult to, to get anything done. Uh, when I read about the uh, two congressmen from different parties joining together, I thought, well, what a great idea to, on this speaking tour. It's kind of like a, a modern day Paul Songus and Warren Rudman uh, joining forces. And I had flashbacks to uh, the beginning of the Concord Coalition. And, uh, you know, our focus as an organization is fiscal policy. It's about the, the budget, exciting things like that. Uh, and a lot of times that is, you know, people say, well, we're never going to do anything about those issues until we tackle some of the structural problems with the political system that you have to fix the process as well as fixing the, uh, the budget. And so I think the two things do go hand in hand. And I thought it would be a good idea to talk about uh, their main subject, which is uh, political reform. But they're also interested in fiscal responsibility as well, one f from the Democratic <coughs> perspective and one from the Republican. Uh, and it seemed to me that that was a nice package to uh, bring together, and no, no better place to do it than here. So with that as a, as a background, let me just ask uh, Patrick and, and David to kick it off and tell us a little bit about uh, what they're sure. doing. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Bob, for having us. Thank you to the Concord Coalition for your leadership on, on these issues. Uh, John, thank you for your introduction and for hosting us to, to the school. Uh, one of our favorite parts about this is answering your questions, so uh, we, we look forward to that. And, and John, in your intro, uh, you, you mentioned you know cutting wasteful spending, so I'll just tell a, a quick story about that. Um, imagine being a new member of Congress. It's like starting school, starting law school or anything. And, and you know, you're going to change the world. You're excited about what you're doing and you're passionate and you have all these big ideas. And, and here I am and I'm, you know, 29 years old and, and elected to Congress. And uh, one of the first things I, I wanted to do is get to know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. But what do they do? First thing leadership does is almost starts to separate the two parties right off the bat, where you have retreats that the Democrats go to and then retreats that the Republicans go to. And right off the bat, they start you know, insulating us from 
the other team saying, what in the heck is wrong with that? So uh, long story short, end up meeting a freshman Republican and we go out to dinner one night and we realized that we actually agreed on a lot of issues, more than we disagreed on, in fact. And we especially agreed on the fiscal issues. And at the time, if you remember, in 2012, 2013, there was this conversation about the grand bargain happening, this big fiscal conversation, sort of a Simpson Bowles, you know, updated, you know, solution. And I said, hey, as a freshman, you know, class, let's let's do something here with our fiscal house. So we identified about three, four hundred billion dollars in wasteful government spending, inefficient spending, fraudulent spending. Heck, everyone agrees with, with that, right? That's an easy thing to do. Let's go put this bill forward. So we identify this. I'm working with my Republican colleague on it, getting ready to introduce the bill. And right before he says, Patrick, Patrick, stop, stop. Hey, give me a couple more weeks. I got to go through something here. Something came up. Just give me weeks and we'll drop this bill. OK, I don't think anything of it. Fast forward about six weeks, and I see him out you know, one night at an event, and I say, hey, what's going on with this uh, legislation? You told me you were going to drop it. Something doesn't smell right. He'd had a few drinks, I think, and he says, Patrick, he said, look, uh, Speaker Boehner found out I was going to do this bill with you, and we're trying to beat you in two years from now in your election. If we do this bill, you're going to get a headline back home in the Palm Beach Post that says, Patrick Murphy cuts wasteful spending. You know, heaven forbid that that might help you win your reelection. We cannot do that. And if you do it, Boehner threatened him, we will drop you from your committees and make sure that you don't raise any money this cycle. So he said, Patrick, look, I'm sorry. You know, if you're here in you know, six years from now, maybe we can do this. Uh, I didn't make it that far, unfortunately, <laughs> right? But uh, nevertheless, um, that was what a wake-up call to me. Like, holy cow, that people are more worried about an election in two years from now, I just gotten elected, than they are cutting wasteful spending, something that we should all agree on. And I don't tell that story to be partisan, because the truth is Democrats did that to David Jolly in a story hopefully he'll get a chance to talk about. So both parties' leadership are so ingrained and more concerned with, with having the majority and defeating people than they are actually getting anything done. And that, to me, was a, was a wake-up call early on in my career in Congress, that there are certain structural problems preventing any sort of conversation on the debt, on unemployment, on health care, on the future of work, on student debt, on climate change, you name the issue. It almost doesn't matter because these structural problems are ripping us apart. So uh, I'll go real quick uh, and sort of outlining what they are. Uh, the money, of course, I think we all know about in politics and happy, hopefully we get to dive into that a little bit. Uh, the gerrymandering of the districts. 90% of congressional districts are predetermined to be Republican or Democrat. Right? The media. Number three, has become more and more rigid, more and more partisan. And not just Fox and MSNBC, but the newspapers we read, and then the social media uh, that we all follow and the, the circles we're in. Right? The lack of relationships in Congress. We used to know each other. Members of Congress used to be friends. No longer. They don't know the other side at all. Uh, the cameras in every committee room, everywhere in Congress. Members of Congress, I always make the joke, it's like Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> Except David, he's great looking guy. <laughs> but they're always pandering to that camera, trying to get reelected to that group of people that are going to you know, vote for them. Uh, and then the lack of regular order. There's no more process anymore that people follow to get things done. So you put all this together, it's all connected. We got a mess in our hands. The good news is, we can fix it, right? People can get more involved uh, in their political system at the local, state, federal level, uh, but it takes a little bit of work from all of us to vote, uh, to get involved, maybe to volunteer in a campaign, to throw a couple bucks to, behind someone you believe in. And, and there are ballot initiatives out there that are helping to get us back on the right course, but it's gonna take work from all of us. So um, I think I spoke too much on the front end here, but look forward to uh, getting more into this. So thank you again for having okay. us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bob, to Concord Coalition, to UNH. Thank you to each one of you for being here today. You know, Patrick and I had similar experiences. He was elected as a Democrat in a Republican-leaning district. I was or elected as a Republican in a Democratic-leaning district. And I tell the story that when I first ran for office, I was polling at 1.5%. And the margin of error was 4. <laughs> so, so you can imagine where I started out. <clears throat> It was the first time I had ever run for office, and even to today, I'm still a Pollyanna, I'm still naive, I still am optimistic, but certainly as a first-time candidate. I, I kind of believed in all that was good and right about politics and, and in the door-to-door -door kind of grassroots campaigning. You quickly get overcome by the reality of modern-day politics and some of the structural challenges that Patrick mentioned. 
Very importantly today, as we have this discussion, you know, we will never extract pure politics out of politics. The founders were politicians themselves in many ways, though they had uh, other day jobs as well. And in fact, the system was designed as a contest of ideas. And the founders believed that we would reach a better product if we had these challenges between uh, men and women of ideas. What has happened, though, is what George Washington warned against, which is the rise of factions. And in modern political history, what we have done is we have so emboldened those factions that we have perverted what was the original design of the founders, this contest of ideas. And we really saw it begin in the very early 1990s as kind of big data became available and as the Republican Party quickly figured out, and I think the Democrats would have done the same thing if they had been able to do this, Republicans deployed a 50-state strategy to begin to take over state houses that could control gerrymandering and a primary system, while at the same time embracing the rise of a dramatic increase in political giving, particularly outside money, that was later affirmed by the Supreme Court to allow truly independent outside money. What does it mean? What it, what it means is the decision making of a, of a young naive candidate who thinks that their job is to represent the entire community comes up against a system where you realize the incentive is not to represent 100% of your district, but to represent, in my case, the 48% that voted for me in my first election that in a gerrymandered district with a closed primary system, your pathway to keeping your job, your pathway to political success, your pathway to reelection, is not by waking up every day thinking about your entire community, but to think about your party. And frankly, the money begins to pour in from those partisan donor constituencies as you prove how loyal you are to your side of the aisle. Patrick mentioned 90% of the districts are currently drawn for one party or the other. That's absolutely true. We can be angry about it. We also can fix it. We are seeing state ballot initiatives begin to require fair districts or in Arizona, an independent redistricting commission. But I'd ask you to think for a moment about how that incentivizes political decision making of elected officials. I know that sounds kind of mechanical and wonky, but think about the 90% of members today in Congress whose job security is based on their performance in a district that is drawn for only their party. And if you're in a state with a closed primary where you don't have to listen to independent voices or those across the aisle, it only perpetuates that supermajority decision making. You become a sheer partisan thinker, if you will. And we talk about this not to slam our former colleagues, not to insult them, not to criticize them. They are behaving in a way that the system rewards. The opportunity for voters is to begin to unrig the system, deconstruct some of these structural protections for incumbents, begin as voters to change state constitutions for more fair districts, whether it's geographic compactness or electoral competitiveness, to examine, as New Hampshire has done and as Massachusetts, that independents still get to participate in a primary. They just have to choose which party or another. In the state of Florida, it's truly closed. If you're an independent, you're not allowed to participate in a primary. And that's fully a third of Florida voters. New Florida voters are registering as independent at a clip of 40% to the low 40s. Voters are able to change those, those structural protections, if you will. And at the end of the day, what it accomplishes is greater accountability between the voters and the elected official. We have heard for decades, a lot of people are advocates for term limits. We can have that debate. There are, there are reasons to support it, reasons to oppose it. But what we often point out is if we were to create a level playing field in the majority of congressional districts, where you have to compete for every vote, where voters are now able to hold their members of Congress accountable, we wouldn't really be talking about term limits. I think we'd see half the House flip if they had to compete for their seats every two years. Instead, it's essentially a lifetime appointment if you benefit from a supermajority district in a closed primary state. We say that because there is a, a movement of ballot initiatives across the state that though it's a mechanical answer to impassioned concerns, it is a very effective one. We don't offer or advocate for a specific prescription, but for those who are saying, why can't I understand the decision making of members of Congress? Why can't I understand politicians? 
briefly consider the incentive model for those politicians and then see what we can do as voters to shift that incentive model to create decisions that are more responsive to a broader constituency that currently are given voice in today's Washington. Well, I think the uh, <clears throat> thinking about incentives makes it easier to explain some of the problems with the federal budget, uh, which we can get into. But let me, let me uh, ask you a little bit um, how this plays out with, with regard to the budget. Now, it seems to me that there's a fairly broad consensus between Democrats and Republicans in Congress that the budget is on an unsustainable track, if you, you look at it long term. Um, do you think, before we get into any sort of potential solutions and how that plays out, <clears throat> in your experience, how, I mean, do members really understand the nature of the problem that we have with the budget, that it's not just the appropriations, we've got these entitlement programs with aging baby boomers and maybe the revenue stream that we had in 1980 isn't enough to keep up with that? Uh, is that, is the, is the basic nature of the problem well understood by the members? Yes, I, I think it is understood. And I think if, if they were all in a room with no cameras and microphones, uh, they would uh, be more open to talk about that problem. Uh, but they also know what group of people, if any, are going to vote on that issue. And it's probably more likely, especially in, say, Florida, for example, that Social Security and Medicare are going to be the number one voting issue. And therefore, if you talk about it, if you touch it, you are a goner. And to the point David just made, uh, most people want to keep their job, right? That is what you're going to do in whatever career that is. And in most congressional districts in Florida and across the country, if, if you have 15% of your particular congressional district that are going to vote for you to get you reelected, then, then that's the problem. So let me, I'll just unpackage that real quick for everybody. 90% uh, of congressional districts are predetermined, they will be Republican or Democrat, right? So if you're gonna say a safe Democratic seat, the only election that matters really is that primary election, right? No Republican's ever gonna beat you in that safe seat. So how do you win a primary? There's about, on average, 15% of the country or, or of a district is showing up to vote in that primary, 15%. So I know exactly who those 15% are, right? I know the, the, the mail that they read, the websites they go to, the TV stations they watch, and probably the issues that they care about most. So you're going to appeal to that group of people. And you kind of play that out as a candidate, then as an elected member of, of Congress, and you know what it's gonna to take to get reelected. It's that same 15%. So you have 15% of the country determining 90% of your members of Congress. And that is where the cycle begins to get reelected. So yes, they understand the issue of the debt and deficits, but when it comes to who's gonna vote for them, what they're gonna vote on, often that's not the issue. Maybe guns is the topical issue. Maybe it's a woman's right to choose. Maybe it's uh, climate change. You know, it depends on, on that district. Uh, Oftentimes, it's not the budget, though, unfortunately. And in 2010, with the Tea Party, we saw that rise. We saw a lot of talk about it. But those very same members today have just voted for a budget of $1.5 trillion in deficits by 2028. I, I noticed that. Right? So, <laughs> well, hello, you know, the hypocrisy, right? Patrick and I don't disagree on much, but on this one, probably by a matter of degrees, I'll disagree with them. I, I think the level of, of subject matter ignorance on the budget in Congress is profound. On the process, right? Uh, yeah. Well, no, even on the elements of the budget. So, uh, I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah. No, look, I, it, so Concord Coalition is going to fact check me on this. So I'm going to say I'm speaking in broad generalizations here. So don't fact check me on this. But um, two buckets of federal spending. You have mandatory spending, which are your benefit programs, your earned benefit entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Interest on the debt is also mandatory. We have to pay it. 50 years ago, that represented about 30% of our budget, and 70% was discretionary. We could decide from year to year, do we want to spend more money on defense or energy or education? We could shift it around in moments of national security. Fast forward 50 years, those numbers have flipped. Mandatory spending is pushing 70% of the federal budget, and discretionary is only 30. We don't get to change mandatory spending. If you are of retirement age and you have worked for 10 years, you are entitled to the benefit that you earned. As a result, the ability to balance the budget is simply not there in today's political mechanisms. It requires a grand bargain to look at revenue and outlays and benefits. And 
most members of Congress, it, it infuriates me when I hear them say, well, if we cut foreign aid or if we cut earmarks, we can balance the budget. They are either absolutely ignorant or they're lying to you. Neither one of them looks good for a member of Congress. I shared an anecdote that Republicans had a, a budget that was passed about three years ago when I was in office that balanced in 10 years, at least they suggested it did. It counted revenue from the estate tax because the estate tax was expiring and so it counted the out year revenue of now the expired estate tax cut. So there was new revenue coming in that was counted. We sent the balanced budget over to the Senate. Two weeks later, we voted to repeal the estate tax, of which I was a co-sponsor of that bill. And before the vote, I went to now Speaker Ryan and said, you know, Mr. Chairman, how are we going to adjust the balanced budget numbers we just sent to the Senate for the fact that we're cutting roughly $300 billion in estate tax revenue? And he said, oh, we don't pay for tax cuts. We don't worry about that. And so I voted against a very bill that I had co-sponsored because of, I, I had the benefit of two decades of staff experience to know how the system gets played a little bit. Look, we can't expect every member of Congress to be a subject matter expert in every area. But in terms of the challenges that the Concord Coalition wrestles with and the good work they do in terms of educating members, I do think they're, the subject matter expertise on hard budget issues really is not there in today's Congress, my opinion. Well, there's a split decision there, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because if you, I, what, what worries me about the political gridlock is whether people understand that the political gridlock doesn't just mean you're treading water. The political gridlock in the budgetary sense means you're, you're getting worse because you've got an unsustainable situation because, as you pointed out, so much of the budget is on autopilot. If it wasn't, maybe you could say, well, the gridlock doesn't have long-term consequences. Uh, but if the debt goes up automatically every year, not because of decisions Congress is making, but simply because they're not making any decisions, your, your, your default mechanism is for a rising debt. That's well, and you hit on an important point, Bob. We, we will talk a lot about structure and mechanics, but we can't extract from this process that it is fair to judge the, the leadership integrity of the people who sit in office. Right? If leaders on both sides really wanted to push for Simpson Bowles and were willing to lose their election over it and were willing to take the scars, then that's a leadership decision that we could respect from a perspective of advocates for fiscal responsibility. The truth is they haven't chosen to use their political capital in that area, and as voters, we get to judge them on that decision. Well, as you uh, both alluded to, you're kind of at uh, ground zero for some of the entitlement uh, issues coming up with, particularly with Medicare and Social Security. So as uh, Floridian members of Congress uh, worried about the budget uh, and your constituents, the well-being of your constituents, um, how did you address that, that issue when it, when it came up? I'm sure both of you had to do it. Yes, no, no doubt. It's a very important issue in Florida and the rest of the country. The way I always looked at it was the sooner you address this problem, the better off we're going to be. And if we have a, a chance of ensuring that these programs are going to be there for future generations, uh, then we better start having that honest conversation. And that doesn't mean, you know, getting rid of them, that doesn't mean gutting them. That means making sure that, you know, future generations is going to be sustainable. There's a revenue conversation there. there there's a, a benefit conversation. There's a lot that can be done. And just in the period of time since we were elected, in that six-year period, the problem's gotten that much worse and every day that we wait it's getting worse and worse and, and uh, becoming almost less of a realistic conversation where people are almost putting their hands up saying what, you know, what are we going to do at this point so uh, it's a tricky conversation no one wants to have that honest conversation with the voters because it will most likely cost you your re-election or election and I unfortunately fear that it's going to take a real moment of crisis in our country before you have enough members of Congress on both sides of the aisle willing to say I'm willing to lose my election to do what's best for the country and the benefit of future generations. And I don't think there's enough will in the same vote on the same day at the same time to do that. It'll take that. that you know, sort of cataclysmic moment to do that. I don't know what it is. In 2012, we got close with that grand bargain, uh, but still not enough. Simpson Bowles, if you would ask our, you know, colleagues, you know, quietly, would they vote for is the right thing? I don't know, 80%, 75% probably would have said it's the right thing to do, but they didn't have the courage to vote for it. 
There's a, there's a foundational policy debate around, let's just say, Medicare and Social Security and the fact that they are cost drivers of the budget. And that foundational policy debate is whether or not they are safety net programs or whether they are earned benefit programs. They emerged in a time when we had the war on poverty and we were concerned about people falling through a safety net. But it very quickly became accepted by, by voters and Americans, myself included, that these are benefits that we contribute into and we should benefit from regardless of whether we need a safety net or not. I think that debate has to be reopened if we are going to responsibly talk about Social Security and Medicare. At the same time, I think you know most of the reforms that have come in has, have said if you're under 45 or under 50, we're going to begin to tinker with the formula. Look, I think if you're in your 20s and you have been in the workplace and paid taxes and contributed FICA taxes to Social Security and Medicare, you're not too young to expect that the government honor the promise it made to you. So though it is a longer curve towards balance and to uh, solving the trust fund issues, my attitude is if you're in the, if you've currently contributed to FICA taxes, the promise of the government should be honored to you regardless of your age. We should recognize the out-year obligations of Social Security and Medicare, bond it, put it on the balance sheet, recognize it as debt, figure out how we're going to pay for it. But if you have not yet entered the workforce, then let's talk about what Social Security and Medicare might look like for you. We can ensure it is still the best system in the world, but it might be a combination of a personal retirement plan with simply a safety net program. It will certainly include means testing and income testing. It will certainly include changes to retirement ages. But at least we are being a fair broker in establishing the rules before somebody begins to make a financial life plan around it. The challenge with any, with any reform right now that affects current recipients are always off the table in the debate, but even those who are within 20 years of retirement, I'm 45. I've, I've received that notice from the Social Security Administration quarterly saying this is your benefit. The government shouldn't be able to change that because those weren't the rules of the game when I first entered the system. But we can have a conversation about what it should look like for those who have not yet entered the system to ensure it's still the best system in the world, but one that's sustainable. Well, another issue that's uh, difficult, not just in Florida, but everywhere, is, is the role of revenues uh, and whether or not part of the solution lies in higher revenues, and if so, how to do that. Uh, any thoughts on revenue as part of the solution? <laughs> Patrick's got this one. <laughs> Are you recording? Yeah. I, uh, I've got a follow-up question for you alone, David. I, just... <laughs> uh, I, I always made the joke there were eight CPAs when, when I was in Congress. I don't know what there are now, probably two. I mean, who knows? But uh, when, when you start having the, this conversation in our little CPA caucus of eight, you know, uh, it, was, it was really fun because you start really getting to the revenue side of things and what can we do, and then you try to bring it out to your colleagues, and like you get this glaze over their eyes, <laughs> tax, what are you talking about? Uh, but, but this for sure is a conversation that we're, we're not taking seriously, and our, our revenue side uh, hasn't kept up with the way business is, is evolving uh, and how global uh, so many uh, companies have become and, and how things are changing. It, it really hasn't kept up at all. So you almost, you know, we talk about tax reform, and in many ways you almost need to start from scratch. The complexity of that is, is hard to fathom. Uh, I think there's got to be a sort of transitional period, an optional three four-year period as you, you make that move. Uh, but if we continue on this path, I think we all recognize it is unsustainable uh, on the revenue side. More and more people are, are uh, uh, finding ways in those loopholes. Um, you know, Dave and I sometimes get in a conversation about lobbyists. Uh, one of the things I never realized before I got to D.C. was most lobbyists in D.C. are hired to stop progress not to create it, right? I mean, they really don't want the big changes, right? Because the big companies, the GEs of the world and Honeywell's have a tax system that works pretty well for them. <laughs> they don't want it to change, right? So they've got all sorts of, you know, folks out there preventing that kind of progress. And so when you start having this, this tax conversation, all of a sudden every excuse in the world comes out about why this program and that benefit and that loophole can't be touched. Uh, and it, it's really getting to a breaking point. And you look at the, the most recent uh, reform, 
and the one that's being proposed in the next two to three weeks, adding another three, four hundred billion dollars of annual deficits, uh, more loopholes and making them permanent. Uh, you got to put your hands up in the air and say, you know, what is going on? And, and the, the party that's meant to be fiscally responsible pushing this, uh, it, it's, it's scary to think about where, where we go in the trajectory we're on right now. I'd say tax cuts should be paid for. And I'm willing to embrace the notion of what's called dynamic scoring, which is if certain tax cuts contribute to economic growth, we should recognize that as a matter of accounting. Uh, but I think we are a long ways from suggesting that trickle-down tax cuts actually create economic growth that pay for themselves. History has proven that's not true. Um, I think we're seeing great irresponsibility coming out of Congress right now. One of the tricks that they, that both sides of the aisle do, but Republicans on the Hill really in the past 15 to 20 years have done it, is as a matter of accounting and budget, tax cuts are temporary. And they set an expiration date so that they don't have to count all of the out year loss of revenue, only a little bit. Well, you can imagine the expiration date they set. They set the expiration date right around pivotal elections. So you find the politician that's willing to say, I'll let the tax cuts expire and everybody has a tax increase, they're not gonna do that. It is one of the charades that contributes to the game. And, and one of the points where I made earlier, where we get to judge the leadership integrity of our elected officials and hold them accountable if we agree or disagree with them. Let me add something. We didn't really get sure. too much into Medicare. We're talking more Social Security for a second. But I know you mentioned that, and that is one of the, the big cost drivers, right, is health care. Uh, we have the most inefficient health care system in the world by far, uh, the amount of money spent in, in the health of our, of our nation. And this is one of the areas I really think Congress can make a lot of headway on, is making a more efficient program. And whether you like the Affordable Care Act or not, one of the real topics and, and goals of it, not that it was achieved, but one of the real goals of it was to have a healthier society that didn't rely on all the treatments, where you were incentivized for healthy behavior, where you were incentivized to go to the doctor once a year and catch that ailment in you know, phase one, stage one, instead of stage five, and that preventative treatment. And you look at around the world, the countries that have succeeded in, in bringing healthcare costs to nine, 10% of GDP, as opposed to the 18 or 19% that we're paying as a percent of GDP. GDP, and that's really one of the big differences of what they've done. And that is, I think, one of the biggest opportunities we have in our country for uh, that sort of cutting that wasteful spending and, and getting more bang for our buck with our taxpayer dollars. That could be a win-win. I mean, yes. you get a better health care system and it does it. Right, we have to be healthier and you're saving money. Budget. David, uh, on the, back to the tax for a minute. <laughs> Just, do, do, do the members of the Republican caucus really believe that the tax cuts that large would pay for themselves, or is it more or less a convenient theory? I think some of them believe it. Um, look, we try not to make judgments. Everybody gets to make their value judgment. My value judgment on the decision making of Republicans during this tax bill is that they got it fundamentally wrong on just about every level. And that's my personal opinion. We should keep the history of the free economy that our country has embraced is one in which we should keep taxes as low as possible to pay for our current obligations. We have ignored paying for our current obligations for a very long time. And it is beneficial every two years for reelection to provide the tax cut but not own up to the spending or the revenue side. Uh, the only answer to that truly is to hold elected officials accountable. And when we go back to these mechanical answers of unrigging supermajority districts, that's one of the realities. I was in a 50-50 district. I mentioned I won as a Republican. President Obama had won it twice. I won it twice as a Republican. It forced me to take on more consensus issues. A Republican willing to approach talking about marriage equality and climate change and gun control and reasonable balanced budget. And do we talk about Social Security reform? I ended up being redistricted to one that favored President Obama by 11 points, and that was pretty much the end of my political career in Congress, at least for now. My only lament in that redistricting was that we knew the poll, where the polls were. In that 50-50 district, we would have won by 56 or 58 percent as a Republican willing to grab a hold of controversial hard issues and speak reasonably to them. Because I think that the broad consensus of voters want to see responsible leadership. We never got to test that case because of the redistricting. 
And my lament is I wanted to be able to go back and show my Republican colleagues, but honestly both parties, that you can, you can approach these hard issues, do it in a responsible way, and ultimately people are going to reward that at the ballot box because what we want ahead of any ideology is responsibility among the decision making of our leaders. We have a system today where you don't have to be fully responsible because you're insulated by these, these rigged mechanisms. And, and to that point, I'll, I'll add a little something about you know, facts, something we don't talk about much, but it is one of the real core problems is we are not operating from the same set of facts. <laughs> um, and you can really blame, uh, perhaps, you know, blame, but media has a lot to do with that, right? Where, where you're not seeing the same news reported on MSNBC and Fox. It's not even the same story anymore, much less the same version of the story. And I, I know we're, I think, I know I'm certainly guilty of uh, going to websites and watching news stations that sort of confirm my current beliefs. Every now and then I'll go to Fox, uh, but I get mad when I watch it, so I don't even do it. Uh, and, and more or less, I think most people are kind of guilty of that. And then what's even getting worse, especially for the younger generation, is, is social media and, and the apps that they go to. It's, it's so easy to just surround yourself with people that confirm your current beliefs. Uh, we all do it and it's kind of where we live. Often we hard harder to affect that, but the people we follow online um, has made us all more rigid in our beliefs, the news we read. So we keep hearing this same story say that cutting taxes and this trickle down works and it's good and here's the evidence of why. If that's all you read, you're gonna believe that. And if you never see the other side of the conversation, then, you know, gosh, it, it's really tough to have that honest debate. And our colleagues in Congress are reading the same news, basically, that we are. They're oftentimes not exposed and, and pushing themselves beyond to look at all sides of this conversation. And they don't have to. It almost doesn't benefit them to do that, because guess what? We know that 15% of people that are going to vote for them are reading the same things that they are and tweeting in that, that same conversation. And Bob, scale yeah. matters on the budget thing. The first 200 years of our republic we accumulated $5 trillion in debt. Right, around 1990, we were at 3.8, 4.5, finally got to 5.1 around 1994. That was 200 years of a, of a surplus balance ledger, surplus deficit. We're now at 21 trillion. Frankly, we've doubled it in the past four years from 10 to 20 trillion or whatever that number is. It is getting away from us. And at the end of the day, budget issues are national security issues if we don't begin to constrain it somehow. I'll, uh, we're going to take some questions now uh, from the audience. Uh, I'll just give you uh, one, one of Warren Redmond's favorite uh, procedural uh, ideas uh, was the first thing that everybody should do is every member of Congress should submit their resignation and then negotiate a budget deal. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe then uh, things would get done. Okay. So when you talk about the budget uh, and the numbers, you're really talking about leadership in Congress. And I always thought of the Republican Party as the party of fiscal responsibility. And that's what the leadership over years and years uh, used to, uh, that, that was the mantra. And I look at uh, Paul Ryan, and I'm saying to myself, what happened to him? Uh, here's a guy who's, uh, who was a fiscal hawk uh, and, uh, and who's not running for re-election. So, w I mean, was it all just a charade, or what, what happened to Paul Ryan? Wh where did he go? That's, that's the question. What happened to Paul Ryan? <laughs> David, you get the easy one. <laughs> I, I, I thank you for the question, and I and I'll. <laughs> no, look, I, when I turned 18, I registered as a Republican, and it was because the defining issue for me was fiscal responsibility, and that's what Republicans were talking about. Republicans were talking about balanced budgets, and I believed it for 20 years. I don't believe it anymore. And the only way I can answer your question is to say I think you're right that Republicans say one thing and do another. It is a personal opinion based on my personal experience. I'm sure Paul Ryan would have a different answer to your question. We lived through an era through the 80s of believing trickle-down economics would create massive economic growth. I still believe tax cuts generally 
in economic theory should create economic growth. So does a deregulatory agenda that we're seeing right now from the Trump administration. But when we fall into the Wild West, we also fall into the financial crisis that we saw roughly 10 years ago. And Republicans have failed to recalibrate their convictions around fiscal policy that actually is healthy. And it's one of the greater disappointments I have as a member of the party. And why I voted against every Republican budget during my years in Congress. <laughs> but I'm concerned, I, things work in cycles. And we go the New Deal and then Reaganomics. And I'm thinking that we may be entering a new one now. Excuse me. It's kind of a democratic cycle where we're proud to be liberals. And supposing in 2020, Democrats do what Republicans have done and just say, we're going to borrow $2 trillion to pay for free college and pay for everything else and not go back mm -hmm. and repay the way Clinton did and Obama did. At least they tried. And so I, I think that tilting at windmills about anybody caring about deficits is a real concern because it could just go. If we're 20 now, we could be 40 in four years. This is an interesting yeah. question. Is if, if, succinctly, if Democrats take yeah. control, will they abandon the PAYGO principle? Uh, you, you make a great point, and you think of the sort of the some of the younger Democrats now watching politics, been watching politics, and maybe look at some of President Obama's efforts, whether you believe it or not, was, was trying to be more responsible, was looking at uh, certain things uh, and talking about Social Security, right? He made an adjustment there uh, down the road with Social Security. He did some things that progressive were very mad at. But there was no reward for that, right? There were very few sort of moderate Republicans that voted for President Obama. There was no reward for it because there's other issues that become more important than the debt, to your point. Whatever that issue might be at the time, that, that is timely. And that's unfortunately why I become sort of pessimistic on this issue, that I think it takes that crisis moment. And I don't know if that's a recession. I don't know if that's uh, something you know major that happens, a, a war, hopefully not. But something is going to have to give. And, and what's even scarier to me is it's not just the US, right? I mean, a, a lot of countries are racking up it's very serious debt, right? Our debt to GDP is still under, you know, 100%. It's at a scary time, but it, it, but you look at China's is I like think 280% of GDP. You look at, at Turkey. You look at a lot of developing economies where their debt is, and we have a, a real debt problem in the world, right? It's not just us. And how you pay the piper on that is going to be very scary when this starts unwinding. And I sometimes fear the next financial calamity we have is going to be even worse than 2008 because of the, the sheer rise of debt that we've had and the amount of debt that, that America's given out in QE1, QE2, and what Europe, what they did. There's a lot of money out there that I don't think is really going to be accounted for correctly. I appreciate you asking that question. You know, the debate around the Affordable Care Act, what has been called Obamacare, was about universal access to health care that was affordable. As the left has moved towards a Medicare for all advocacy plan, the way to pay for that is incredibly elusive, if not impossible, without a dramatic escalation in taxes. It, you may not actually even be able to cover it through tax increases. So the, the hard reality of numbers, I think, will ultimately caution against, say, a full Medicare for all proposal if Democrats take over. I think what we will see Democrats do if they take the House. And this is based on nothing more than just being a student of the institution for a couple decades. They will make the case that if we roll back the Republican tax cuts, we can pay for another trillion dollars in spending on specific programs. It will sound good, and it may be something that a lot of people support. But recognize that's still deficit spending. It won't be roll back the trillion dollars in tax cuts to pay down the deficit and not incur future deficits. It will be, we will pay for our democratic priorities by rolling back the Republican tax cuts. That's still just as much deficit spending. Republicans just paid for it with tax cuts. Democrats want to, ran up the deficit with tax cuts. Democrats want to use it for spending. It's that struggle. Republicans come back mm -hmm. eight years later and, it, and do another huge tax cut, which has been the pattern, and now you're right. Now you're at your 40. Right. Yeah. All the benefits are still there. Right. That's the, uh, the, the nightmare scenario of uh, you do have political compromise. Uh, you could have political compromise in the sense of let's have the Republican 
tax plan and the Democrats' spending plan. <laughs> we'll, we'll compromise on that, and then things could get even worse. So in 1986, the last one of the last great grand bargains, um, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan got together, and they um, put together a plan which passed that increased, uh, essentially overfunded uh, Social Security. Uh, brought a lot more people into the system, raised rates a little bit. Uh, and that was supposed to solve the, you know, the looming demographic um, story that we live now. Uh, so I have kind of two questions on that. One, why didn't that work? And two, if it didn't work, why should we pay any attention to any plan that would come out of this? Good question. <laughs> Fuzzy math, right? Uh, the, a lot of the numbers are, are, are somewhat fungible when you start going through this, and, and it's, of course, based on a lot of estimates of, of future revenues, of, of, of age and timing and population growth. Uh, so there's a lot of estimates that are in it. And when you start getting these out years that David alluded to, it gets even fuzzier. Um, every incremental grand bargain we have is, is better, but the, the really, really, really honest one is probably not feasible unfortunately. And a lot of this gets to that, that question of leadership and do we have those leaders in office now uh, and are they willing to even talk about this and, and have that conversation about what needs to be done? Uh, yes, I think these problems are solvable. It might not be in five years or even 10 years. It might be a 20-year plan, unfortunately, to get back to a budget of, of surplus and, 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 and fiscally responsible programs that will be there for generations. But I, I do think it's doable. Um, and, and I think when you look at, at the markets, what they want more than anything is is predictability, predictability and, and certainty, where they know that at least you're on a path toward uh, you know, a solution. Whereas now, we're, we're not on that. And I think we're sort of you know, on, on borrowed time right now, because when people start doing more digging, uh, I th they think they, they really see what lies beneath. And often, you don't do that digging until you're in a recession or when things are bad. So um, I, I think we should have faith that they can do it, but uh, we're going to have to hold them accountable that they can actually do that. I think most grand bargains in both budget, national security, infrastructure, whatever it might be, uh, are offering generational solutions to a generational challenge. They're not offering permanent solutions. Uh, too often they get sold as permanent solutions, but the reality is they're generational solutions to a generational challenge. And so we saw that in 86, where Reagan and O'Neill knew that this would solve it for a generation, and largely it has. It expanded beyond a generation, if you will. But we are now confronting what do we do next. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because it, it did work for, it did do what it was supposed to do, which was postpone the problem for a generation, as you say. So, and the, the key was that both parties did buy into it because, I, and I think this is the importance of bipartisanship, is if you look at whether it was the, the Bush tax cuts or Obamacare, and now we're seeing it with, the, uh, with the, the Trump tax cuts, if you have a solely partisan major initiative, it has trouble sustaining itself because you only had one party support to begin with. Whereas in that, that, that Social Security reform you talked about, that was a very tough vote for people. But it was, it did have bipartisan support. So some of the tough choices that were made in that, whether it was raising the eligibility age, raising the payroll tax, which was kind of the grand bargain involved there, held up over the years. And both of those things actually took place and, and, and have remained in place. And so one of the things that I look back on the 25 years of the Concord Coalition is one of the things that's been actually most remarkably consistent is the Social Security projections. Uh, that, you know, 25 years ago, they told us when the cash deficits were going to start. It was, almost, it was almost identically accurate. The trust fund insolvency date has varied a little bit over the years, but it's still about the same as it was then. So, you know, that was a, that, that was a good example of something that worked. So I think we can take from that that bipartisanship solutions actually can uh, be used to address these problems. So uh, given the theme of uh, essentially hyperpartisanship and lack of representation, um, how do you feel about efforts um, to address that that are not addressing gerrymandering, but instead uh, focusing more on things like ranked choice voting initiatives? And do you feel like that could have any potential for uh, addressing or solving we those got problems this last representation? Night. Uh, so personally, I support anything that disrupts the current rig system. I know we use that term a lot, but <clears throat> I say that because 
from a electoral science standpoint, we are in the early part of a generation of measuring uh, new approaches and the data is slowly coming in. So California has a top two primary system. It's an imperfect platform to measure because it's such a deep blue state that it's largely producing two Democrats. And so it's hard to study the ideological accountability, if you will, among diverse populations. In Arizona, on the gerrymandering piece, we're seeing independent districts, and that's now being studied, but we're still just within five years of doing that. Ranked choice voting in Maine and other states is new, and the, and the data is just slowly coming in. Each one of these are disruptive models intended to empower voters, which is why I think any, any system that we currently are experimenting with, if the focus is on empowering voters, and breaking the control that long-term incumbent legislators have. That is good for democracy, good for the country. Ultimately, a decade from now, we're gonna have data that allows us to say, this worked, that didn't, or maybe we go in this way. But I think it is a, a wonderful experiment in modern democracy to pursue changes like this. And it's, I wish there were more experiments happening in states, right? And I love that intent that the states are the sort of incubators for all these ideas and then let the federal uh, folks take a look at what worked and what didn't with, with that data. But we do need more um, examples of, of making sure people feel like their vote does matter, that they are involved in the system, that they can make a difference. Uh, because we have a generation right now, I think, questioning democracy. Right, there was a really scary poll I read and we've talked about before, uh, or something like, I forgot the exact number, something like 30% of millennials aren't sure democracy is the best form of government. That's a really scary stat, really scary number, and it's starting to question um, the foundation of our country. Uh, and I think it's because of the lack of progress they've seen on so many issues. Uh, so we, we've got to make sure that we, we come up with this system that works and everyone does feel that they have a voice before it crumbles. And if I may add a, a data point that we have gotten, a, a real life example, and one of the things we encourage people to do if you're interested in kind of these nuanced mechanical issues, there are campaigns right now to address gerrymandering and primaries and campaign finance. They're occurring at the state level, not the federal level. If it's of interest, pursue it. A great data point is out of Florida. Our redistricting occurred because voters said we want geographically compact and concise districts. The Republican legislators in, in Tallahassee said absolutely not. So League of Women Voters and some other groups ran this four to six year ballot initiative and voters voted by about 75 or 80 percent to require geographically compact districts. And it was called fair districts. Neither Patrick nor I challenged that initiative, but analytically speaking, it defined fairness by geography. The result was your four to five most centrist bipartisan members are gone. Because by adopting a fairness test of geography, I'm gone, Gwen Graham, her district switched to one that favored Democrats or Republicans by about 20. Patrick Seat got vulnerable, Carlos Corbella, Ileana Ross Layton. And as a result of fair districts focusing on geography as the fairness doctrine, we created a, a more partisan state delegation. You could defend that and still say geography is the most important thing. We talk about, I talk about personally, what if we had the same initiative but required electoral competitiveness as a fairness test? Create as many 50-50 districts as possible. Perhaps include that with geography to create a standard that actually increases competition and ensure the result we get is the same. This is very early in, in the incoming data, but it's a good example of where some initiatives have the intended effects, some have the unintended effects. Well, I want to thank <clears throat> Congressman uh, Jolly and Congressman Murphy for giving us uh, some hope for the future and for continuing to fight for uh, both fiscal sanity and, and electoral reform and p political reform. So uh, let's give them a good hand and wish them well. Thank you.